I hope that you can see my screen. I'm Alexei Gyuri from Uber, and I'm going to present about handling flaky tests at Uber scale at the DevOps Pro 2020 conference that is going to be purely online. Um, I'm a software engineer at Uber Amsterdam. I wanna start the presentation with the context and the context is going to be uh, the scale of Uber and what we are operating at. Then I'm going to introduce the problem, which is uh, flaky tests on our side. Then I'm going to present a solution that we have developed on how to deal with flaky tests at this scale. Um, so this is going to be mostly about understanding the problem and understanding one possible solution for it. And finally, I'm going to present a wrap up where I'm going to talk about uh, what we have implemented and uh, what we are going to do in the future, possible improvements. So I wanna start with uh, Uber scale. So Uber is active in 63 countries if we include subsidiaries and minority stakes. Now, I would have wanted to say that we're active in Vilnius, but uh, due to the quarantine, we're not in Vilnius, but we are online. And online, you're still going to be able to order Uber Eats in a lot of countries. And actually, for a lot of countries right now, this is the only basic way to uh, get restaurant food available. But we want to talk about developers today. So now I can I want to talk about how many engineers actually work at Uber. So we're talking of, at Roughly 4,000 developers. This always depends on how you count. Do you count the manager who maybe develops or a couple of lines of code a week also as a developer? So this number is, can vary. Which develop a diverse portfolio of apps and services? So that's what I mentioned. You not only can order your taxi through Uber, but you can also order food and you can actually ship freight through other apps, so it's not only the taxi service. When we look into the countries, we can basic, so these are the countries that actually people work from who develop for Uber. So we can see that not only is sort of the service offering quite global, but also the development happens on a global scale. And this is a rough estimate of the number of commits per day. Um, on a recent time frame, uh, so you can see that it's roughly one commit per developer per day. But of course, this is going to fluctuate, and not all developers develop every day, uh, etc. Um, so when we look at runtime, and when we look at the number of actual services being there at the company, we can see that this is a massive, massive uh, graph of different endpoints, APIs. Uh, actually, let me move this maybe a little bit down. Uh, yeah, there's no way to hide it. But uh, yeah, um, when we look at runtime, we can see that we have many different endpoints. But what about second? But what about tests? So when we look at tests, um, we obviously want our software to have tested. I don't think I need to explain this further. We have seen this massive graph of services at runtime. Um, and obviously, you would want ideally to have a test for each of the different dependencies that we have at runtime. So sort of our module here is going to be in blue. Other services which we may not depend on are in gray. And the ones that we depend on are in amber. So we can obviously do a lot of mocks in order to sort of test our internal functionality, but what about integration and end-to-end -end testing? We can have a couple of end-to-end -end tests to the modules, but it's very hard to write end-to-end -end tests at ser as services may be down. Uh, they may actually not offer end-to-end -end testing uh, capabilities. Uh, so without being up, they may not offer any way to sort of start uh, a dummy um, engine or and may not offer an API for tests, we quickly end up with untested incompatibilities within our service to modules that we depend on as obviously this sort of huge graph is ever developing. So what we end up with, if we sort of have code in different silos, which are 
without any way to sort of interact is that we have with regards with respect to the number of our total um, amount of uh, APIs that we use, few end-to-end -end tests. And a lot of the import tests that we actually use have to be mocks that at runtime rely on API stability. So obviously when there's changes, we have to rely on the developers sort of not changing their API. I mean, which is always ideal. So an idealized version, people may not change the API, but still have uh, changes uh, in the behavior. So the idea at Uber a couple of years ago was to improve this. And if we think about sort of this concept of continuous integration, theoretically, any CI pipeline has to balance two things out. One is the quality of the software that you're gonna ship. And on the other side is the workflow that you enable your developers. So let me illustrate this with two extremes. One extreme would be, uh, Side. If you have no tests at all, you would have a very lean workflow, but you would sacrifice quality because, yeah, no tests, developers can push all they want. Essentially, it's probably going to blow up no matter how good your developers are. But if we look at the other side, if we have too many unnecessary tests, we're gonna slow down the workflow a lot as we will need for all of these tests to pass. We will need to maintain these tests um, and our quality perhaps will improve. Um, the star here represents that this cannot be obviously guaranteed through tests, but for, let's say for the sake of simplicity, we'll assume that it is. So any CI pipeline balances this one out. So what Uber did in this situation is that Uber decided for a monorepo approach in order to shift this sort of quality scale, uh, quality velocity scale towards quality. And our team in particular is the Android and Java developer experience. And so I don't wanna go into the full monorepo argument because this is a very nuanced kind of thing. I can recommend these three articles. You can find them all online. But the main idea was to put software, so essentially all code into one location, which makes testing imports and testing dependencies easier because you can execute um, tests on, so if you, if you program a module and you have other modules which depend on your program, when you do a change, you can actually test them as well, test their imports of your module, and this will improve the overall quality of the software. Of course, this comes with risks, and we're actually going to explore one of these monorepo risks. Not only does it sort of has it this uh, amortized cost that you need to do the transition, but it also has this cost of problems that you may have. But the ideal last solution is that you move from sort of this environment where you um, have different packages in totally different locations. And to ship, you need to first pick them apart and sort of put them all together and hope that it runs into a more, um, uh, well, into a more regulated, into a better structured solution. So the new testing situation um, ideally looks like this, that you, instead of mocking everything, you can unit test stuff from the same monorepo. But what may happen is of course, if you have N dependencies and each dependency has M tests at, at test time, you will need to run N times M tests. For, for each dependency, you need to run, let's say, all tests. So in the worst case, we may have 100,000 tests that need to run with our amount of code, which I've, so this is, yeah, it's a little bit less actually in practice. So we have 8, uh, 82,000 
Reinhardt and three tests, which had to be run. And in this case, they had to be run in parallel as this is basically necessitated. You cannot expect them to run in a serial manner as sort of even if um, they run, let's say for 100 milliseconds per test, you're going to need 8,000 seconds to run them all, which is already quite a long time when you remember this number of commits that you want to do and you obviously want to test all of them. So in summary, we have a larger scale. So obviously Uber grew over the years. It's been uh, founded in 10 years ago. Um, and this larger scale has necessitated more quality control. And there was this move towards a monorepo. And now we have a lot of tests running in parallel. And now we get to one of these, the problems that happen at such a parallel scale. This is flaky tests. And first of all, I wanna start quite dry. I wanna talk about the definition. Uh, so a flaky test for us is a test that is displaying non-deterministic behavior across multiple runs, which means some um, runs fail and some runs pass without you knowing exactly why. So the environment remain, remains the same across multiple runs, but some runs fail and some runs pass. So I want to illustrate this with a little example from Alice, who is going to be a developer. And she's going to develop um, a live streaming app. Back when I did this presentation, this was like a, quite a, a moonshot, but it seems to be that actually we, we would have needed this live streaming app during this conference. Um, but yeah, uh, so she has written an, a backend service, a, a conferencing app, and there, she relies on the Uber compression module to do sort of the nice video compression. So, so even in bad, completely overloaded internet connections by all of these guys working from home, we can ensure a nice and fluent uh, live stream. So let's just ima imagine she has already developed the app. She's a good citizen. That's why the, the crown is there because she developed uh, nice tests for it. But now we have sort of a black swan event. So one week before the conference, there's a bug in the compression algorithm and the Uber compression module needs an urgent update. And as it is, it always happens that these bugs, they happen like one week before the actual date. So now she wants to test this. And on the first run, so she, she, she runs her tests for this, for a module. And with the new Uber compression module, the first run fails because we have some race condition in our test. So a couple of tests here fail. In the second run, so she finds this strange and tries to rerun these tests. The run actually succeeds. But in a third run, there is one test that didn't succeed. So we are seeing this non-deterministic behavior, which I have explained before. And this keeps Alice very frustrated as she doesn't really know where the hell, how do I fix this? So I, I obviously don't wanna push this code, but there's a time constraint here. The update of the app is needed because we want the smooth streaming experience for the conference. So what we can do, we start, can start whack a mole and sort of disabling um, certain tests. But in the end of the day, we, we don't know which tests these were exactly, and we have to push because if we don't push and uh, ship the software, we will not be able to do the conference or there will be a security issue. And when you do these pushes a couple of times, what happens is that your CI pipeline essentially becomes quite useless because the more, like let's say one test has a probability of 10% of failure. When you have a hundred of these tests in there, your percentage, your probability of at least one of them failing becomes close to hundred percent. So when we recall this theorem of quality and developer velocity, now we are kind of in this um, 
oxymoros, oxymoron uh, situation where we neither have good quality nor have a good velocity because the quality is jeopardized as we have pushed flaky, perhaps we don't really know if it's flaky or if it's actually a, a software bug. And we have developers which, whom are frustrated with their uh, testing experience. So we neither have good develop, uh, developer velocity nor good quality. And this is sort of our problem here. So we are seeing that not all tests may be fit for parallel execution. And one point that I want to mention there is that this, that this situation might have been caused by this migration from a micro repo where we had mostly mocks and maybe a couple of imports to a mono repo situation where we have so many different um, imports and tests so that they need run in, to run in parallel. So, um, and we can see bad tests can cause flaky behavior. This flaky test might have been, um, for example, something that tries to reserve a port, but another test, which is now ran in parallel, has tried to um, reserve the same port. So it's very, very hard to identify the baddies because firstly, we have a lot of tests. You've seen this huge number of up to 100,000. So picking them by hand becomes quite unfeasible, but also reproducibility is very difficult. So flakiness overall hurts developer productivity. So now we finally can come to the solution that we came up. And I'm going to present sort of one solution, then I'm going to present the problems of it, so, and then I'm going to present the next solution. So we kind of iterated on multiple solutions here. So the initial solution was to have a monitoring job, which would run all tests within the mono repo at once. And it would try each test three times. And then we would have sort of um, an automatic disabler, which detects which tests fail and would add, so right now we're in a language specific context where the Android Java developer experience. So this is just going to be for Java and Android. In Java, you can add the disabled annotation to any test. You cannot do this, for example, in Go where they don't have annotations at all. Um, but what, was the, what were the challenges with it? So um, this fix needs a source code change and the source code change itself needs to pass through the CI pipeline. But what if the CI pipeline is so unstable that your fix doesn't pass through the CI pipeline? You will be needing to force push um, all of your changes. And the other part is that we can only disable tests, but we cannot sort of um, try to run them, let's say, in a serial manner. And the third problem with it is, is that it's fully language dependent. So we, are, we have at Uber multiple monorepos, one for Java, one for Go, one for web code, and a couple of others. Um, it's, it's language dependent. It's not gonna work on Go with the annotations. And it kind of felt like doing this whack a mole game of trying to find the flaky test and the test in hiding quickly, because as you know, Murphy's law, when you try to reproduce it, it's not going to be a failing. It kind of felt like hammering down whack a mole, but just with a bigger hammer. And what this led to is we may have had a bit of a better developer velocity, but because we disabled so many tests and some of them may have been perfectly valid, we have jeopardized on quality. So the improved solution that we then iterated to was a test result data warehousing solution where we would have our test analyzer solution. We are calling it TAS. And um, that doesn't hammer down tests, but that instead warehouses information about test failures within our CI pipelines. So we would still have the monitoring job but instead of automatically disabling, we would firstly collect all of this information. We would collect information from manual triggers of our CI pipeline. So we would have Jenkins essentially. So when we look at this graphic, hosting to Kafka, all the tests that failed. And then we would also 
write these events into a database and would have our test analyzer querying what the test status were, uh, was. And then Jenkins, when you actually run the CI pipeline, can query the test analyzer to know which tests should be run. So um, we would have actually three different pipelines for that. Um, so depending on its prior history, so if it was um, a test which never failed, we would put it into the parallel pipeline. If it was a test where sort of using um, empirical knowledge, we knew that it was going to be fine if it ran in a serial manner. So think about this port situation where two tests try to assign uh, the different ports. Of course, this, this is a very simplistic example, but maybe think of them trying to start the same database um, and the database sort of only supporting a singleton uh, mode. And we would have a flaky pipeline for all of these bad citizens that try to push and that get into race conditions. Um, and the sort of logic that it followed here was that if a test would fail the parallel uh, monitoring pipeline, it would be put into a flaky pipeline and the flaky tests would, in this flaky pipeline would be always tested in a serial in a parallel manner. So we'd essentially have two Jenkins instances testing them in parallel in, ser in serial mode. And if it succeeds 99% of the time, when run in a serial way, we would put it into the serial pipeline and then monitor it there. And only if in the serial pipeline, the test always succeeds, um, would it remain there, else it would go back into the flaky pipeline. And promoting tests back into a parallel manner would only happen if we had a code change and if we had a success rate of 99% of the time. And the interesting part is that by default at Uber, you cannot push your changes without them passing CI, but um, we would make an exception for the flaky pipeline. So if your test, so let's say you write hundred tests, 99 of them are not flaky and one of them is flaky and gets put into this pipeline. If the 99 pass, you can still push your changes. And the improvements here were that we were language agnostic. So since we have the situation that Jenkins queries test analyzer before running a test and queries the running mode, we would be language agnostic and we would not rely on annotations anymore. And we can filter tests in runtime. Uh, in real time, what does that mean? If there are two parallel runs and in, say in one run, uh, bad test A gets, um, becomes flaky, so we identify it as flaky. If there is a parallel run, it will immediately know that this test is flaky. And let's say in the first run, that this test was run at the beginning. And the second run, this test is run at the end. Since at the beginning here, it was identified that it is flaky, we can, and this other Jenkins instance, immediately say, okay, this is a flaky test. It's fine for it to be pushed. We also provide a front end to the developers where you can um, query the status of your test in which pipeline it is. And if we, here we also did multiple iterations. This was um, iteration at the beginning. Right now it more looks like this. So per Fabricator revision. So we use Fabricator, which is very similar, an open source version of uh, GitHub essentially. Um, and here you have this revision ID and per revision ID you would have different, um, so D is the revision. And in one remission can have multiple commits. And here we can see for this commit, we would have about 2000 flaky tests and 20,000 parallel tests. And then you can sort of filter how did each of your individual pipelines run. So sort of blue here is the parallel pipeline. You could click on the serial pipeline. How did my tests do? And if you have errors, you can immediately jump there and see what um, error logs happened. What were our problems? Obviously, many edge cases, as it usually is. We would have weird test names. We would have different test runners, uh, which we would have empty test names, for example. Um, 
this is all due to various different implementations of uh, test runners on Java. Um, a lot of things with different base classes. So we actually, in an, another iteration step, we um, split this whole test parsing logic from the core logic of um, giving you this test report. So this whole parsing of, in this case, we use back, but could be Bazel or any other build, Gradle, any other build system, build system logs parsing is now um, split from um, the actual ingestion into the database and the service that gives Jenkins uh, the info and runs. So to wrap up, we have the context of monorepos at Uber, and we have the problem of parallel testing that causes flaky tests. Our solution is a test analyzer service, single source of truth about unit test health and unit test parallelism problems with three pipelines of parallel, serial, and flaky tests with automated movement. And now I'm going to present some ideas about future work that we have. So one could be a test flakiness score. So here, um, look at the source code to the left. We have the worst case, which would be, so the vector represents um, the rate of failure, the rate of passes and the rate of ignores. So ideally, in the perfect case, we would have one zero zero and it sums up to one. And we kind of want to introduce as in machine learning, you have metrics for um, quality. We want to introduce a flakiness metric where ideally you are at one zero zero or maybe even at zero one one. So that would represent no, no, no successes at all, but all failures, so no flakiness. And we can ca calculate a stability score per test and visualize it to the developer. And then we can sort of take this further and model a dynamic threshold using Bayesian learning, where we can look at the sort of posterior probability of flakiness given an error log and a code. So we can model this into a nice machine learning problem. We can output this test quality prediction with given like the likelihood of an error log happening given a flaky output, which we can calculate from sort of our historical data, some prior flakiness probability, general flakiness probability in our monorepo. And we can normalize this by the probability of this exact error message happening. So the probability of this particular error message. So this becomes a classical uh, machine learning problem. But we, and then we can take this even further and we can start surfacing to the developer common causes of flakiness in his tests. So let's say you're using database connect in your test. We can suggest to you to switch to a single database connector in sort of your base test class instead of trying to connect to a database um, in your test case or even to spin up a database in your test case. Uh, we've seen it all. And our final sort of future idea is to have a slow pipeline because we, we realized that in the serial manner where you need to pass up the stick, some tests may just be very, very slow and cause the whole pipeline to run for multiple hours. So we actually want to introduce a third, a fourth, sorry, slow pipeline for very slow tests. And now I wanna talk about the teams. So we are the developer experience for Android and Java in Amsterdam. This is uh, my team in particular, but we also have, we actually have an office in uh, Vilnius but the, we are geographically distributed between the between San Francisco and Amsterdam. So thank you all for listening to my presentation on handling flaky tests at Uber scale. Um, I'm now going to switch to Slido. Let's see if we have any questions on Slido. Okay, Need to wait. Okay, we have the question from Kai. And Kai has asked the question on how do I deal with the flaky tests? 
Do you fix them or do you just ignore? Um, yeah, so obviously fixing is the best case, but what we have seen in practice, what happens um, is that developers, they don't wanna fix their tests a lot. They wanna develop new software. Um, so it's usually quite a slow process to actually fix the test, which is why we also get into this surf. So at the moment we don't surface the information. I mean, they can query the exact source of flakiness, but it's not surfaced to them well enough. I think it needs to be essentially spoon fed to them on a silver plate so they can easily identify flakiness. It's like I've represented, presented very easy examples here. But as you've seen, it could be just due to parallelism of different stuff um, influencing each other badly. And this could be totally different packages. So it can be hard to fix. But for example, this database connector was one example where we could identify one problem for flakiness. And this was that essentially in each test, they were spinning up their own database instance instead of just spinning it up once and uh, reusing the database and in each test sort of flushing the database and uh, restoring the schema. Um, but so yeah, so we can mitigate this sometimes, but it's hard. And a lot of the times we have to ignore to sort of ensure velocity. So re recall sort of this uh, theoretical uh, slide. Um, so we kind of have to put them into the flaky pipeline and ignore them for uh, some time. But obviously, our, so one of our initiatives actually was to make the serial pipeline that I've displayed here also blocking your pushes. So it at least has to work fine on the serial pipeline. Essentially, obviously, we want to reduce this as much as possible. So after this, so this is an ongoing development. So after we're, we get this into a very good state, we actually want to start reducing the number of tests which are in the flaky pipeline. So this is the ultimate goal, of course. I hope that it answers uh, your question. If uh, feel free to ask a follow-up if you want to. Refresh Slido. Okay, it doesn't seem that we have other questions. Obviously you can uh, find me, uh, feel free to ask me a question later, but I would wrap up my session and thank you all for joining in and uh, see you all around, bye.